Unlike Lena's story, where the basic plot beats remain the same, even as the underlying message slightly changes, the story of Rose Shu has the opposite happen. Rose's arc in the book and her arc in the film are almost completely different, but they have the same underlying message and moral. The reason for this is probably because the story of An Mei Shu, Rose's mother, is the most faithfully adapted part of the film. This makes sense, as it is the most autobiographical part of Amy Tan's book, with An Mei's mother being heavily based off Tan's own grandmother. And the message of Rose's story is probably one that is very near and dear to Tan, herself married to a white man, as it discusses that lightning rod topic of white men, Asian women couples. So, in the film, Rose meets her future husband, Ted, in college. Ted is a rich kid who is used to people telling him what he wants to hear, and he is immediately drawn to Rose's frank and blunt nature. When Ted takes Rose to meet his parents and his mother tries to dissuade the Asiatic from seducing her innocent white boy, Ted stands up to his mother and wins Rose's affection in the process. Things seem fine at first, but after getting married and actually having to be a wife to a high-society wasp, Rose's status as a racial other starts to weigh heavily on her, and she slowly crafts herself into a submissive, geisha-like housewife to show that she is worthy of being by Ted's side. She even has a child with him, solely because it is something expected for a housewife such as herself. Ted is very clearly unhappy and makes this apparent, but Rose only digs herself deeper, until finally the marriage breaks, and Ted asks for a divorce. Things look pretty bleak, but thankfully, Anmei is there to give some sage advice, and tell her own story. When Anmei was young, her own mother was forced to become a concubine to a rich man, and as the child of her mother's previous marriage, Anmei was in an especially lowly position. It was only after Anmei's mother committed suicide on an auspicious date that Anmei was allowed the opportunity to demand a better lot in life, being able to wield the vengeance of her mother's ghost as a viable bargaining tool. That was the day Anmei learned to shout, as she puts it. And, sure enough, by reasserting herself, by shouting, just as she did at the start of their relationship, Rose is able to become the woman she once was, and she and Ted are able to resolve their marital strife. In contrast to his film counterpart, Ted in the book is a complete louse. He's a louse, okay? Just, he's a complete louse. In the film, he's Andrew McCarthy, but in the book, he's James Spader, all right? He is spoiled, he is entitled, and he becomes dissatisfied with Rose, not because she loses that special something, but because he grows bored with her. Even when he confronts his mother, like in the film, the source of his anger isn't her racism, but the fact that she tells him that he cannot do something he wants to do. Book Ted has already decided that he is entitled to Rose, and no one can dissuade him otherwise. Rose in the book, meanwhile, has done her best to fully assimilate into American culture. And you've never been with an Asian guy, right? No, Why? because, because like, they have small dicks. Because it's like dating my own brother. I didn't look. I didn't you need to and while Ted's dominating personality is a clear warning sign of his lousiness, it is also deeply attractive to Rose. Book Rose is terrified of responsibility, because when she was a child and she was put in charge of all her siblings, her youngest brother Bing drowned. This is why, despite Ted clearly being bad news, she likes how he makes all important decisions for her. It is really only after he grows sick of this attitude of hers that she finally starts to see his true colors. And after much soul-searching and counseling from friends and family, Rose learns to shout, to make decisions for herself, and to tell Ted where he can stick it. Now get out of my house! In Rose and Ted, the book and the film of the Joy Luck Club both present an Aesop on the subject of white men, Asian women couples. That Aesop being that the women in these relationships should not feel pressured to conform to stereotypes or racist expectations. A relationship is a partnership, after all. Both sides have to be on board for the thing to work. 
The main difference between the book and the film in this regard is in how they choose to tell this Aesop. The film chooses to show what makes a healthy relationship healthy, while the book chooses to show what makes a toxic relationship toxic. And this change makes sense. After all, Hollywood does love its happy endings, so injecting some positivity into Rose's story helps take away some of the book's bleakness. However, as we will soon see, this change, as well as other changes to the overall story, had some unintended and tragic consequences. But before we get to all that, there is one more story that needs to be told. Alright, so, about those babies. As mentioned earlier, where the other characters of the Joy Luck Club have one major conflict in their subplots, June has two. The first has to do with her mother's hopes for her, and the other has to do with the stories her mother tells her before her death. The film begins with this story being told. The old woman remembered a swan she had bought many years ago in Shanghai for a foolish sum. This bird, boasted the market vendor, was once a duck that stretched its neck in hopes of becoming a goose. And now look, it is too beautiful to eat. And the fabled swan continues to pop up throughout the film. It seems like some basic Chinese fable with a little hint of Americana thrown in, but there's just one problem. As other people who are far smarter than I am have pointed out, there is no prior basis for this swan in Chinese myth or fable. Tan seems to have made it up, almost completely whole cloth. So what gives? Why go to the trouble of presenting a made-up fable like it's the real thing, instead of drawing from an actual pre-existing mythical stable? Critics of Amy Tan have said that it's because she's a shameless, shameless traitor, traitor whore to her fellow Asian Americans, but I have a slightly different take on the subject. To me, the narrative purpose of the swan story is best summed up by this particular scene. For a long time now, the woman wanted to give her daughter the single swan feather and tell her, Is the swan real? Is there really a swan? I don't know, baby. It's my mama's story. And we can't ask her because she's dead. Let's ask ourselves, why do we tell fables, myths, and other stories? To preserve culture? To pass down tradition? Those are all good answers, but why do those? The answer is to validate our existence, and to be proud of who we are. Think about it. We say pithy phrases like representation matters, but why does it matter? Why is it so important to see people like us in stories? It's because by seeing a story so similar to our own, we can see that we are not alone, that we matter. But here's another thing. How many of us remember all the stories our parents told us in perfect detail? How many of the lessons imparted actually stuck? How well can you pass down the same stories to your own children? If there is one thing all the stories of the Joy Luck Club have in common, it's that disconnect, that which gets lost in the generational gap between parents and children. And in the case of June, this is especially poignant, because unlike the other daughters of the film, her mother dies before she can fully reconcile with her. This brings us back to... The babies. You know, two babies... The babies. That's right. All those years, June believed that her mother had killed her babies. But after Suyeon passes away, June finally learns the whole story. On her way to Chungking, Suyeon came down with dysentery. She could no longer feed her babies, and her own strength was fading. So, she placed the babies by the side of the road, with all her money and belongings, in the hopes that someone would find them and take care of them. And then she went off to find a place to die, not wanting to do so in front of her children. But, unfortunately for her, after passing out, 
Suyan was found by a medical van, and she lived. June never forgave her mother, because she didn't know any of this. Nor did she know that Suyan had spent her whole life trying to find her children, or that, after her death, her friends finally succeeded. The film ends with June going to meet her half-sisters. But before this, she is forced to confront the fact that there was so much about her mother that she never knew, that she never bothered to learn. So much of what Suyan did now comes into focus, such as her transfixing all her hope onto June. But so much still remains a mystery. Even after June discovers an actual swan feather, which her mother intended to give her at some point, with no real-life mythical base to work from, this really only raises more questions than it answers. What does the swan feather mean? Was the swan real? June and we are bursting with questions, but we cannot ever find the answers to them because Suyan has passed away, and with her have gone the answers. The swan's fable is a paradox. Instead of being told to preserve something across generations, it represents the idea of that which is lost across generations. It perfectly captures the themes that Amy Tan is trying to convey, and presents a very heartfelt and very personal message. Admittedly, if one were to take the swan as an actual Chinese myth, or to regard the Joy Luck Club as some cultural anthropology documentary, one would come away with a rather warped vision of the world, but surely people are smart enough to not fall into such an obvious trap, right? 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 